Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Sylvia Blahutova, and I'm in charge of Affluent Perspective in Europe. And I will be joined by my colleague, Chris Melchiori, who is responsible for our Affluent efforts in the US market, and who is also heading our customer research in both US and Europe. Chris? Hi, everybody. Thanks, Sylvia. Uh, we are very glad that we see uh, you all uh, in the webinar because we have quite a bit of data to share with you today. Uh, you can see that we have uh, several points we would like to walk you through today. Uh, first of all, for those who are not familiar with our work, we are going to share with you uh, some basic facts on Affluent Perspective. We are going to spend some time uh, exploring the latest insight on the COVID-19 tracker. And uh, after, we are going to focus on the latest data from uh, this year's Affluent Perspective Global Study. Uh, we hope that uh, those combined are going to provide you some insights and some uh, valuable information on the global pandemics, on the affluent population and uh, the global markets. And uh, as we all hope that the situation is going to go back to normal um, at some point, uh, Chris is going to walk you through the chapter written to market, who is going to uh, shed some light on the expectation when this uh, time will come. And also, uh, also uh, what we should be looking at uh, when looking at different categories uh, or industries. And finally, we are going to uh, touch base on social responsibility, as this is a trend that we see in uh, last uh, waves of the study. Uh, we are going to see how it is even more important during the pandemic and how this can be a great opportunity for the brands uh, after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So you can see uh, we have quite a lot on our plate today. Let's get started. So uh, before uh, we share any more data uh, from, uh, from, from the study, uh, we want to maybe explore uh, the, the Affluent Perspective study and what it is. Uh, the study is syndicated product that exists for uh, over 15 years, and then is entirely focused on the affluent population, the wealthy class worldwide, uh, that representing five to 10% uh, of, of the population. Uh, we track all important regions in the world, North America, we do horizontal cut of Latin America, uh, European market, which is really important, Middle East and APAC. Uh, this year was concluded with uh, more than 9,400 interviews, which is a big jump in comparison with last year when we uh, had 8,600 individuals completing the, the survey. Uh, the aim is really to understand uh, the global population, the wealthy class, which is very niche audience, as we can all agree, and not only to uh, understand who these people are and what is their lifestyles, but also uh, have a good understanding of how they, how they spend their discretionary money. That's why uh, we track, uh, first of all, the behavioral uh, pattern, uh, the attitudes, uh, the passions, uh, and also uh, we have deep dives into uh, categories that are somehow connected to the, uh, to the spending of, of this wealthy class. So uh, we also track uh, industries such as travel, finances, um, retail sector, and also uh, luxury sectors, uh, including fashion, watches, and jewelry. In each category, uh, we also connect um, this spending to leading, uh, leading brands and companies. So we have more than 350 brands included in the study, which is very useful. And uh, we believe that this is something that can be uh, afterwards um, implemented in, uh, in your uh, strategies and action plans. And uh, both combined, provide us with the trends issues and patterns that we uh, we track and and share with you uh, as i mentioned this year uh, the the study it's done twice a year uh, the first wave was concluded uh, in 
uh, mid-March uh, this year. And uh, at that moment, the pandemic actually spread and uh, started to have effect on the global uh, economies and, uh, and markets. That's why uh, we, um, we decided to uh, conduct additional recontact surveys uh, to, uh, to really uh, understand the evolution uh, in terms of actions, reaction sentiments and concern of, uh, of this affluent panel. Uh, there were four, uh, four sets of uh, recontacts, uh, as you can see on the right side. Uh, the first one was conducted uh, late March in the US. The second one, again, in the US two weeks afterwards. The third one uh, was enlarged by Canada, so North America, Europe and China. And the last was, uh, was concluded at the beginning of May with the US market again. Uh, it is important to mention that we had on average 70% response rate for all these recontacts from our panel. That really just states how strong and engaged is, is our affluent panel. Um, so um, these are the two sources of information that we uh, used for this webinar, for this session. And uh, before we share with you the data from this year, there is some trends that we've been able to track and we think there's something that is worth mentioning, something we should be looking at and something that may be even more important uh, once the pandemic is over. So these trends uh, are uh, first of all mass up. Uh, it's uh, linked uh, specifically to, uh, to quality of uh, luxury brands. Uh, where 70% of the affluent panel agree with the statement that many mass brands now offer a level of quantity comparable to luxury brands. So uh, if we look at the fact that quality is a very distinguished factor for luxury sector, and 70% really think that quality of different products or services may be um, may be comparable, this puts luxury brands uh, under some pressure. Uh, and it's something that we should be uh, looking at um, closely. The other one, uh, the next trend, it's meaning or searching for meaning. It's a big shift in mindset where uh, affluent consumers uh, are uh, making fewer but more meaningful purchases. 78% of the panel agree with this statement. They're really um, they're going for quality rather than quantity. Uh, they uh, want to uh, really connect to the values of the companies that correspond to theirs. They're looking to purchase products uh, uh, that are that, that values are, are very similar for theirs. We are also seeing uh, more interest in experience as the affluent want to spend their time meaningfully. And this third one, the third trend, it's humanity. Uh, with the statement, brands are losing the human touch. So you can see here 67% of the affluent panel agree with the statement and it only grew in time, 54 in 2018, 67 today. Uh, this one, it's uh, somehow um, connected to uh, how the, the companies and businesses are conducted, uh, really uh, not connecting to the customer or to the uh, to everybody that is involved in the process. Uh, and the, the customers, the clientele and affluent clientele are really pushing the brands to be more actionable and to be more involved. This is something that we are going to discuss later on uh, and how uh, is humanity and the human touch important during the current pandemics. Again, uh, these trends were present since a few waves. Uh, amongst affluent panel and only time uh, is going to show us if it's going to grow in importance. Let's pass to what is uh, happening now and uh, how is the situation uh, among the affluent with the current pandemic. So the first uh, and most important thing that we wanted to understand is how concern are these people uh, against the uh, on the spread of the pandemic. Uh, you can see this graphic, it's related to the US market as we've been tracking US affluence through all this series of reconduct. Uh, and you can also see 
how quickly uh, the constant grew, uh, grew from February uh, from 30 to 78 person in, in the beginning of April, but decline with time. Uh, we believe that this uh, this trend is going to uh, in, be present. We also believe that the uh, the way uh, that the the governments uh, are informing about the, the current situation, but also the evolution of the global pandemic, uh, it's making people less and less concerned about the spread of the virus. Uh, talking about the global uh, markets, uh, on the left side of the slide, you can see how the different uh, nations think about the spread of the COVID-19. Uh, we can only assume that it's uh, directly linked to, um, to how hard the countries were hit by the, the virus, the pandemic, uh, leading with Spain, Spanish affluent being the most concerned with 77%, and on the opposite, German that are not very, very concerned about the spread of, of the virus. In general, we can uh, see that the women are more concerned. Uh, we can also say that those who are less concerned are more confident about the economies, about the recession, and that there will be uh, those who are going to uh, go back to spending uh, once the situation is over. So this concern is a very general concern and it uh, contains uh, various elements. So let's look at those uh, more in details. Uh, so the confidence uh, with economies and more uh, detailed personal economy and countries economy, it's something that we would like to understand as well, how it changed in time and how it changed uh, in this uh, current situation. You can see that we've been tracking these data uh, since last year. So the purple color, uh, it's uh, data from February, March, uh, 2019. The pink one are from this year, first wave of the study. So February, March, 2020 and the turquoise, turquoise uh, color, it's uh, linked to uh, current situation. If we look at the graphic on the left side, we can see that there have been some drop in personal uh, economy, the confidence in personal economy across all markets. We can see that there are some that have been hardly hit, such as China from 58 uh, last year to 29, uh, and also uh, Italy and Spain, uh, European markets that has been largely impacted by uh, COVID-19. Um, when we look at the right side, uh, confidence in, uh, in countries' economy, you can uh, see again that the numbers uh, decreased. There are some countries that didn't have much confidence in countries' economy even before uh, the pandemic. There are some that has been largely hit. Um, here we can see China going from almost 80% to 41 in just a few weeks' time which is quite large number, and also Germany that decrease in time. If we think about what personal confidence means, uh, it's uh, very easily just planning the future, uh, saving money for later. Uh, we can tell that people that are some, somewhat confident uh, are still investing and taking risks. Uh, they uh, spend money across different categories. They buy luxury goods. Uh, they are still making some big purchasing, uh, such as real estate, cars, etc. And those who are not confident, on the contrary, uh, monitor closely their household budgets and uh, they try to reduce their monthly living expenses. Um, these two elements are somehow uh, connected to the luxury and uh, spending in this category. Uh, we uh, see that 70% of the affluent panel uh, are also luxury spenders. And uh, that's why we wanted to invest investigate a little bit more. So here it's just the link between how confident are people in the country uh, or personal economy and how it influence uh, day spending in luxury. 34% think that the, the, the country's economy is important when they decide uh, if they purchase uh, within, uh, within luxury. Uh, and 66, which is quite big uh, population out of our panel, uh, think that the personal economy has a great impact on how much and if they spend 
in luxury. So seeing the, the numbers in the, the previous slides and see how much it impact the spending within luxury, we shouldn't be that much surprised despite all other factors that the spending in the luxury sector has declined for the Q1. There is also another element to it, uh, luxury guilt. So in, in this situation, uh, in this climate, it's also nat only natural that people somehow, somehow feel guilty to treat themselves or indulge, indulge themselves, if you wish. And uh, on the graphic, uh, on the, the right side, you can see how each country and affluent from each country think about it differently. So Chinese leading the graphic with 54% uh, feeling guilty when they spend in luxury. And on the opposite side, uh, French and German, where these two countries doesn't seem to be very affected uh, by the global pandemic. Thinking about the Chinese uh, luxury spenders being uh, around 30% of the, of, of the spending across luxury, uh, make us think about what this is going to represent. Uh, the same trend uh, was followed back in 2009 in the US during the, the, the recession. Uh, we can see that the luxury guilt was present and it took some time to go uh, back to normal or to, to slow, to, to be smaller. Uh, we can see that the numbers uh, up uh, are a little bit uh, smaller. So we believed that the trend is not going to maintain and uh, the luxury uh, spending is going back to normal sooner than later. Uh, when we uh, pass to another concern or another layer to uh, what are the other factors that uh, really concern affluent. Uh, these are related to the business and employment, if you will. Uh, this chart uh, really uh, represents uh, how much they are concerned about the, the economy, the businesses and the employment status. On the very left side, uh, you can see that the overall concern um, is quite high, leading with the US and 86% extremely and very concerned about the health of local businesses. And again, Italy and Spain uh, standing out from the crowd. Uh, then uh, when we look at the second and the third um, graphic, uh, the, the numbers are relatively smaller. Uh, so my company will go out of business and I may lose my job statement. Uh, still, uh, on average, quite small. Uh, Italy and Spain, Spain, again, standing out. Uh, this may be also um, linked to the fact that most of the affluent from, uh, from our uh, panel are either business owners or C-suite levels. So they job and the, the industry they work with wasn't that much impacted by the current crisis. Uh, to sum up, we saw that the concerns uh, related to health, to, to economies, personal or country's economy, and also the, the em employment are quite alarming. Uh, the, the people are concerned. But on the other hand, despite all this confidence uh, softening, the personal economies uh, are built to endure. These numbers are very positive, and this is something we should retain from this uh, first uh, chapter. So despite all this, 28% of the income is being saved, uh, which is quite a big uh, number. 72% uh, of the affluent agrees with the statement that their uh, family has never been more economically healthy than right now. These two numbers are coming from the first wave of the study, uh, so we believe didn't change much in the, the last weeks. And uh, moreover, uh, they are in good shape to endure a recession. Again, 83% agreeing with the statement, which is very, very um, promising. Uh, more uh, income, or more household income they have, more confident they feel. And contrary, uh, Generation Z, Z it's uh, less confident about uh, the global pandemic. Uh, let's think about what happened in last recession very quickly. Uh, back in 2011, 
people were uh, were not making that much plans. Uh, they were concerned about the future, and they uh, they uh, did this approach uh, one day at a time. Uh, they did uh, everything to protect themselves, the family, and maintain happiness. You can see uh, the graphic on the right side that they were more confident about the immediate future and less confident about what's going to come in the upcoming months and years. Uh, when we look at the situation today, and this is something that we asked to our panel uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, the situation is completely opposite. Uh, they are less confident about what's, uh, what's coming uh, from now until the, the end of the year, and then uh, the confidence with the future grow uh, with, um, with time. To sum up, uh, the, the current uh, situation uh, brought up some risk. The recession is imminent and what the Afghan people are coming as they have some uh, more discretionary money, they're trying to allocate them to uh, mitigate financial risk, to really uh, put money, invest uh, and spend the money uh, to really decrease the risk. The ability to plan uh, has been compromised. Uh, the uh, more we look in the future, more uh, the confidence uh, in, in that it's, it's clear and, and bigger. And there is also some uncertainty uh, that we can track uh, really related to everything that was mentioned, uh, meaning that the recovery from uh, this current situation is not going to be the same for everybody. Uh, and uh, everybody will have to uh, take some precedence and uh, deal with the situation on their own. We are coming to the second chapter, Return to Market. Uh, we believe this is going to be very instructive and Chris is going to walk you through to what expect uh, from, from uh, this moment. Chris? Thanks, so. Thanks, Sylvia. So as Sylvia mentioned, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. And of course, the first step for a lot of luxury categories to get back into a groove is actual markets being opening up. But even if the markets open up, will consumers be ready to get out there and spend? That's the uh, topic that we're really going to try and get into in this next section. So starting when people, these affluent consumers, think the pandemic is going to end, it's really split. 38% uh, think it's going to be in the next month or two with an additional 29% at the end of the summer. But there's still a good third of the affluent who think that it's going to be not until the end of the year. Uh, this does vary by market. You look at June or earlier where France and China, they're the most optimistic. Canada's somewhat in the middle. And then Italy, Germany, they're really towards the end. I know German markets are trying to open back up now, but the consumers themselves are fairly skeptical that uh, the pandemic's going away anytime soon. The one thing that we will note that in the US, back when we did, we surveyed in March, mid-March, only 19% thought that it was gonna be October or later, advanced that a month and a half in which 46% said that they think the pandemic is gonna be around until October or later. Next. And this is compounded by the expectation that we're not done after this first wave. 85% believe that we are very or somewhat likely to experience an additional wave, uh, with some surmising that it could happen later this year. Uh, there's an increasing window, a limitation of a window for consumers to re-engage as the current pandemic extends into the summer and beyond. The most positive outlook is in China, where 38% think that it's not very or not at all likely to relapse. However, 62% in China still believe that they're likely to experience another wave. And that sentiment is only stronger in Europe, and especially in North America, where almost 9 in 10 believe we will have a second wave. In the most recent contact survey, 59% of the U.S. affluent say we're very likely to experience a second wave, almost up 10 points from the previous wave. Sorry. Next slide, Sylvia. So what was it going to really take for affluent consumers to be competent? Simply put, it's all about the medical component. Uh, we saw, at least in the U.S., when we were trending 
these items that the reopening of schools and businesses were very high. It was a significant indicator of confidence at 72% earlier. And in the US, it's now 37%, so it almost dropped in half. Meanwhile, other things like the availability of a vaccine, effective treatment, and the raw number of cases or decline in the number of new coronavirus cases are really the true indicator of when people will be confident to resume normal life activities. Next. But while this is happening, affluent consumers are getting anxious. 72% um, agree that the more that they stay home, the more they wanna get out and do something. And this does vary by market, but the overall majority in each market does agree with this, especially in China or in Spain. However, we know that this, this might not, the sentiment might not actually translate into action, raising the question of when affluent consumers are likely to re-engage. So the current slide, what we did was ask them when they expect to engage, what month they expect to return to certain activities. And this ranges from connecting in person with family or friends, which is a very important part of the affluent consumer life, to all the way to taking to uh, taking an international vacation. Now, it should be noted that the way we ask the question is based on when they think the pandemic will subside in their country. Uh, in the short term, the two biggest things, or it's really one big greater component, is really a financial aspect of it. Um, and this is mostly due to the fact that you can engage with it remotely. People are very active in buying financial investments, especially in North America and among those who tend to be older. Um, many do feel that it is a good time to engage in the financial market, buy stocks, mostly uh, domestic, but some international as well, as well as sell. So they're really, there's no particular, it's not like they're, a, selling stocks and buying gold or vice versa. It's really a mixed balance. So they really like to be active currently in this particular aspect. The other one is really donating to charities. This has not gone away. We think, while we don't have particular data on it, we do think that the top categories, which are health and social services, um, given the needs of the pandemic, have actually been uh, magnified in this uh, current setting. Next. Next on the list of engagement is personal luxury goods and real estate. Now, starting with the personal luxury goods, engagement is expected to really start in Q2, um, but it's fairly equally distributed through the end of the year. The online, online is expected to recover faster and there is a good amount already going on right now. However, given the increasing desire to get out the in-store in presence, uh, assuming there's an ability to do it safely, maybe close behind. Uh, we have seen some signs of it in China. Um, for real estate, the timeline for buying does not necessarily align with sellers, uh, suggesting supply will still be higher than demand. Buyer engagement ramps up more towards the end of the year, although at much lower levels of engagement than pre-pandemic. So there does seem to be a hit to the buyer market a little bit. No, touching next, thank you. Touching back on online shopping, we have seen that when we asked people what they have, how's the pandemic changed their activities and online shopping, 44% say more. If you compare that to the 12% who say less, that's a net 32 points of affluent consumers doing this more than less. In China, it's 66 points, which is a, a huge difference. And this doesn't appear to be slowing down anytime soon. Almost half agree that they plan on shopping more online even after the pandemic ends. Now there are some you know, concerns when shopping during the pandemic. Uh, now these are US numbers, but I think they apply uh, fairly closely across the board is just the availability online, the any price gouging that might happen, as well as extended delivery times um, that might cause some hesitancy in online shopping. Next. 
And finally, the slowest returns are really in the travel and automotive industries. Some consumers anticipate a Q3 engagement, but engagement is not most likely not to come back until the end of the year, if not to, to 2021. Now, while engagement levels for luxury auto is fairly consistent with pre-pandemic levels, uh, those for travel are down. Last year, 87% of affluent consumers took a domestic le leisure trip compared to 76% who say they are currently or will engage. When looking at international or long haul trips, 64% were engaged last year, but now only 57% say they're engaged now. So those numbers are trending down slightly. And now while they're, it's not completely apples to apples, it does give a, you an idea of how the travel category is, is experiencing a drop in overall engagement and a delay as well. Now, while other all other categories have been affected by the pandemic in one way or another, uh, we we really need to keep an eye on the travel industry the most because this is really where it comes back, oh, where the return is going to be more lengthy than everywhere else. Next slide. So as I noted earlier, the category data presented um, in the past few slides is really framed in terms of a, more of a static situation. The pandemic is going to end here, and we're, we're planning on doing this here. But we did an additional analysis in which we compared the time in which they were to return to the market versus when they think the pandemic will subside to give you a general sense of exactly if the pandemic shifts later and later, how that's going to affect consumer sentiment and when to really expect on a relative basis when they're gonna come back. The general order is the same in which financial, it's already currently doing, the gray bars show that those are, they said they will be back in the market versus the pandemic subsiding at a later time, while the dark purple is those who say they'll be back in market af sometime after the pandemic subsides. So as you see, personal luxury goods somewhat in the middle there, real estate along with just after personal luxury goods, but then we get to the travel and the automobiles um, in particular, look at the 88% who think that they won't go on an international or a long haul trip outside their country until the pandemic subsides. The other point I'll make on this slide is the actual orange line, and that is the average number of months. And I want to stress the fact that it's average. So that means that not all consumers are going to be back at this average mark. That almost 50% potentially will be back after. So if you're looking at personal luxury goods, you're looking at about a month after the pandemic on average, but that could last up to two or three months for many consumers versus travel where the average is almost two and a half months in which that could very likely be longer, especially the other thing I will caveat about this analysis is the last point in time we used was October or later, which many, many of these people, especially in the travel industry, could be looking at 2021. So it sort of undermines or limits that actual average, which could be actually three, four months. Next slide. The last point I will touch at is we want to do a comparison since China is in the process or has been opening up and we have some sort of expectation of how Chinese consumers are reacting to um, reopening. We want to do a comparison because we were getting a lot of questions on can we model a China return with the other markets. Um, and for the most part, at least in terms of consumer sentiment, it's still there. There isn't much difference between a, the European and North American affluent consumer, consumers in China. If anything, when it comes to things like travel, they're actually a little bit more confident and expect to come back sooner than those in China. So we're, it's one of the things that we will keep an eye out, especially as other markets start to vastly open up. Next. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Really, desire for action is building, um, but we can't necessarily guarantee that the behaviors will be there. Just because, as I mentioned before, they're anxious to do things doesn't mean they're going to go out there and necessarily do them because of um, 
confidence regarding the pandemic. Outlook for normality extends. When consumers will be back in the market is uncertain. And then finally, relative indicators are available. I would pay attention to the medical response, the numbers, whether there's availability of vaccine, and other categories, depending on what category you're in, to really anticipate when consumers will be active. Next. So before I hand it over to Silvio, I just want to give you a sense of general trends we've been covering over the past decade or so, even longer than that. So when we look at luxury, pre-recession, looking around 2002, it was all about indulgence, conspicuous consumption, uh, when really the brands were like a badge to affluent and wealthy individuals. They used the brands to express or use the image of the brand to merge in with who they are. But once the recession hit back in 2007, we really saw a movement from this conspicuous consumption to a more resourceful um, outlook. They really looked at what they could get and really took pride in finding the best deal possible for um, luxury goods. As the recession wound down in 2012 or so, there was a shift into a search for mastery, what we call the worth dynamic. And what that really is, is that people would pay a premium price, but they really have to view the value of the item as something um, that is based in the three pillars of luxury, whether it's those are quality, craftsmanship, and service. Now, the shift recently in 2017 or so, it went to, and Sylvia touched on this earlier, is people started looking past the quality because we noticed in the market that a lot of mass brands were you know, upping their game in quality. So what they really started looking for was a personal relevance, something that had meaning to them. It was less about what the brand says about them and what aspects of their personality and their beliefs are reflected in brands. And now that has evolved into something else. While that was more of an internal focus, we've now seen a shift towards an external focus and in action and brands doing what's right to having the consumer values align with the brands and what the brands are currently doing. And the biggest part of that is uh, cor uh, social responsibility. So I'm going to turn it back over to Sylvia. Thank you, Chris. So uh, everything led us to really uh, talk about social responsibility uh, and this is something, the trend that has been present in our study and amongst affluent consumers for a while now. And uh, we also see that this is something that it's even more present nowadays during it. When we look at the, the, what was happening before pandemics, even before supporting an issue that didn't really resonate with all customers was risky or could be risky. But nowadays, uh, it seems like the, the situation does not fit to this category because uh, all the brands uh, are uh, trying to be active, trying to uh, make something that would, uh, at the end, uh, be favorable for, for the company, for the society. And we can see that 75% of the affluent think more favorable about brands that play an active role in responding to the pandemic, we can see that the sentiment is uh, quite, um, quite uh, universal. Uh, almost 100%, 96% of Chinese uh, agree with the statements and think highly about the brands that are actively um, actively involved uh, in, in uh, actions uh, during the pandemic, what uh, what would I would mention here is the U.S. and and the shift from 
percent down to uh, with 12 points in just few years time. So um, as you can see, uh, it's important to take action. And uh, when we talk about the luxury brands and luxury consumers, we noted that more uh, the person it's um, involved in luxury purchasing. So they spend from one uh, category or the heavy luxury consumers, more they think that the luxury brands uh, should help uh, higher standards uh, in comparison to non-luxury brands, brands in terms of social responsibility. Overall, 59% uh, percent of the, the luxury consumers think that they should lead the way the luxury brands should be an example uh, in terms of social responsibility and other sustainable actions. Uh, so talking about everything that the brands are currently doing, uh, all the ways that they communicate and stay with touch in, in customers really to not uh, be forgotten and stay on top of the mind are very naturally um, pivoted around the, the current situation. Uh, we uh, shouldn't uh, be that much focused on what's happening. Yes, it's, it's, it's still present and the pandemic it's uh, still uh, everywhere, but uh, we uh, pose a question to uh, to our panel, and 72% agree that they're a little bit tired uh, of brand advertising related to the, the pandemic. This was asked to the U.S. affluent, but we believe that the sentiment is somehow um, same uh, across all affluent panel. So when thinking about uh, what should be advertised or what should be uh, communicate to our customers, there's so many other ways that we can really uh, stay on top of mind of, of the customer. And there is so many ways we can do so. Um, we uh, previously uh, discussed that uh, the, the pandemic is going to be over very soon and we should start thinking about um, what's going to happen next and which uh, trends are going to be even more important. Uh, let's have a look on uh, all the different actions that affluent customers uh, that uh, are imposing to the brands and what is important for, for them when it comes to uh, privileging one brand uh, towards the other and how they uh, actually making their purchases. So even before pandemics, um, the the way uh, the the brands treating their employers uh, was uh, very important. Uh, then uh, all the other aspects of social responsibility uh, and sustainability activities uh, followed. Uh, we can see that uh, all these kind of actions and aspects of brand. Uh, that the affluent would like to um, to learn more about remain the same globally and there is not much that change apart from the uh, the way the brand treats their employees and it's just very natural uh, if the brand is really taking actions into uh, providing uh, the employees with good working conditions uh, this is something that it's uh, there is few very, very positively. Uh, we can just look on the right side of, of this chart to see uh, how uh, the US uh, trends evolved and how they are different. Um, so um, the only thing uh, to retain from this is just uh, that the other actions uh, took a backseat and what is important is just everything that is related uh, to um, to labor uh, conditions and uh, everything that the brands are doing uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19. Um, at the end, what we did is to ask the affluent panel what is actually important when it comes to uh, the purchasing action. What are, uh, what are the things that the brands are doing that make difference? Uh, and which activities uh, impacts their decision-making process. You can see on the right side all the set of uh, actions that uh, are important and all the list of the actions that the brand are doing to somehow uh, make a difference. Uh, they're all linked to uh, sustainability uh, and social responsibility, uh, going from philanthropy, labor, business practices, um, 
and you can tell uh, that uh, they're uh, consistent across all these categories, environmental efforts, labor practices, and philanthropy. Uh, when it comes to different uh, sectors that we are tracking in our study, specifically fashion and travel, uh, we have similar question and we have similar data points in the context of these businesses. So if you would like to understand uh, a little bit more about uh, these particular actions within these, uh, these sectors, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, so talking about uh, all these different actions and uh, projects that the brands are doing to really stand apart from their competitors, uh, there is also a way uh, how you communicate on all your projects uh, to your uh, audience and to your clientele. Uh, what we uh, saw in, in the study is that there's still opportunity to improve uh, the way uh, the brands communicating with their uh, companies uh, specifically link, linked to the sustainability efforts. Uh, when we look at the graphic uh, here, we can tell that overall um, there is uh, 19, still 19 percent of Afland that, uh, that thinks that the brands are not communicated good enough, and only six and 14 respectively uh, that think that the brands are doing excellent and very good job. Now, uh, when we look about the different regions, uh, overall, uh, those who has, uh, has ranked uh, the best are Middle East and Latin America. In the other regions, there is still space to improve uh, the communication strategy and the messaging that we are, uh, we are um, delivering to, to the, the customers and potential clients. Uh, this is this statement on the right side just uh, underline uh, what uh, what we uh, what we collect in terms of information. So, uh, sixty nine percent of uh, the affluent find very hard to trust blame, uh, brands claim to all the sustainability practices. Uh, here, what uh, is important to remember is that uh, whatever the the brand is doing, uh, the message. Uh, has to be clear if the message is informative and genuine uh, this is something that resonates and play a role when it comes to a decision making process and lead to purchasing of uh, one product or another from the brand to sum up uh, luxury consumers have high expectation for brands to act responsibly this uh, is true uh, this is true uh, during the pandemic or after pandemic it's a universal feeling uh, and the actions that the company the the clients would like to see the brands doing it's caring uh, about the employers and contributing to the case labor practices and sustainability are the actions uh, within uh, social responsibility that are very important and should be maintained uh, universally and as we saw in the, the last slides there is an opportunity that exists to better communicate the message on the different uh, actions within this social responsibility and to be more visible and more uh, open to to our uh, to our uh, existing potential clients um, all these uh, data are coming once again uh, from our affluent uh, perspective global study this is a study uh, that is syndicated uh, it exists in the market for more than 15 years which really provide us with a very deep understanding of uh, the wealthy class high network and ultra high network individuals uh, we have uh, very good uh, knowledge and exper expertise experience uh, then uh, extrapolate to uh, to different industries. Uh, we uh, have a lot of um, a lot of data, uh, volume of data that uh, are connected to the the sectors and activities across the sectors that was mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So there is uh, multiple multiple opportunities for insights uh, in terms of uh, in terms of. Uh, syndicated products of the data data that we already have at our disposal as well as ad hoc and bespoke studies so uh, we have in our disposal a breadth of data from uh, these different categories 
uh, and these are available very quickly. Uh, the, the cost associated to this insert is uh, quite, um, quite uh, interesting and uh, this is something that will provide you with uh, good knowledge on on the sector and uh, the current situation. Uh, there is also a possibility to expand current insight with additional data, uh, really depending on the target population, uh, really integrating new data in the panel and merge into one data set, but also bespoke studies uh, that really provide access and enable affluent uh, clients to, um, to supplement with parallel insights from affluent perspective. Um, I think that I will hand it to Chris, who is going to just quickly describe all the different uh, solutions that exist uh, in, uh, in, in the custom, uh, custom solutions. Thanks, Sylvia. Yeah, and I, I just want to make the point before I even get into that, that we are going to, you know, continue monitoring how the current pandemic is affecting the luxury industry and that really we're able to do that because of the data set that Sylvia described and just the breadth of different aspects of it. And one of the biggest things, not only is the data itself, but the ability to target these individuals. And that allows us in a custom sense to build stories both on, from the syndicated as well as any custom um, data that you require any uh, based off of a, a business question. And that could be anywhere from market opportunities. We do segmentations. Uh, we dive deep into categories, uh, much deeper on the custom side than even on the syndicated as we go down. Um, we look at brands. We look at the really the questions that are most relevant and impactful for your brand and uh, customize the solution around that to get answers for it. Um, and we do other things as well, including custom, customer database and uh, solutions. Uh, one thing that we're seeing in the pandemic is that it's even more important now to keep at your best customers, uh, to make them feel as if they are your best customers, because that's how you will begin to grow back your base uh, or keep your base intact. Uh, and then we do ad tracking as well. Um, so. There's just a variety of solutions, but it's all based on the fact that we can access these people, we can find these people, um, and really target those that are most relevant for your business. Um, Sylvia? Yes, so I would like to maybe add that, uh, as it was mentioned several times during this presentation, we really uh, track uh, the the insights on uh, top five to top ten percent of the population, uh, which is the niche audience uh, and the good uh, good understanding of the customers uh, and the market is crucial. And uh, we would all agree that uh, this very niche uh, audience has to be treated uh, and uh, is is behaving differently. And we uh, have all the all this information at our disposal. So if you have any questions uh, regarding to the data that we have available, if you uh, have any questions specifically uh, linked to this presentation, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, this uh, this webinar was recorded. Uh, we are going to send you over the presentation uh, today or tomorrow, along with the recording, and. Uh, we would like to thank you once again, all of you that join us, uh, and we hope that uh, that shed some more light on the current situation and the affluent population.